Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Take is Excrement, episode 999. That's right, we're almost to our 1,000th episode, and you are our 1 millionth customer. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited. Please present your coupon at the door and get a free ticket and a free lunch. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna overcome Joe Rogan eventually. Fuck you, we're Rogan. Soft little melon we're, head. We're coming. We're coming. We do a fucking ayahuasca. Anyway, all right. <laughs> So, uh, today, uh, what is this? Where, who? Episode oh, nine. Episode nine, yes, of the podcast, which is called Your Take is Excrement, hosted by Neo and, and Nay. Hi, it's me. Uh, you remember me from the internet. So, today, we're talking about the first, finally, I don't know why it took us so long, but we finally got to the first David Lynch movie of the podcast we watched blue velvet this week yay (laughs) it was blue and a little velvety oh no is that all all i have to say about blue velvet or that is that all the jokes you've you brought with you today in your bag lunch my yeah my my joke my joke (laughs) deposits are are running low (laughs) you you, you must construct additional pylons (laughs) to build more jokes Ah, all right all right all right all right all right all right so david lynch uh is is a filmmaker who's one of my favorite filmmakers i'm very excited about him he's in the same kind of world as jodorowsky in a lot of ways he's kind of america's Yodorowsky, even though like he managed to successfully make a dune um yeah <laughs> by successfully i mean it, get fucked we, you can hop on uh hulu and watch it yeah which means like at least there's something if you wanted to <laughs> at least there's something <laughs> i don't know why you would but <laughs> yeah so and ironically this is not your first david lynch movie this is your second right this you've seen third. oh yeah you saw eraser ad as well yeah um but this one is the one where we were like, okay, this one's the one you can get takes about. Because I feel like Eraserhead, while being really cool aesthetically, doesn't have an awful lot going on in there for really you to analyze with somebody who, like, just kind of is there well, for the abstraction of it. Maybe you would need to appreciate it greater so that you could talk about it. Maybe we do it one day. Maybe. I feel I... I feel like I would have a deeper appreciation of the movie if I had a kid. <laughs> fair like I, I feel like a lot of that movie is is pretty heavily tied to like the like maternal and paternal instincts well in a lot of ways i think that it's um it's also a dysphoria movie it's mm-hmm. a movie about your role and how like henry ultimately is rejecting his role right he doesn't want to be a father mm-hmm. but his like desire to not be a father like outweighs his duty to behave as one right Uh genuine conflict anyway so now i'm gonna have uh the little cat boy here meow meow uh neo's gonna be telling us about blue velvet today uh tell tell the good people at home what the fuck this movie's about if you can remember if i can if you Uh, can figure out how well, it's a pretty long and dense movie, so I'm going to do my best. It so, is, which is funny because it I feel like it doesn't need to be. No. No. All right. So, uh the the main character of the movie is uh Kyle is uh Jeffrey, uh played by Kyle uh Kyle McLaughlin. And in the movie, he finds a human ear. Mhm. And, and it's like Pog. And it's like Pog. I need to go on a Harvey Boys adventure to figure out who this ear belongs to. Because I'm a young whippersnapper full of boyish mirth and joy. And 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 I'm a... I'm, He's yeah. a Boy Scout. He's a Boy Scout. I found so an ear in a field. He, uh, <clears throat> he, he starts, you know, exploring this, this mystery with... Sandy, who's played by Laura Dern, um, and they break into they they find out who they or they find a piece of the puzzle that leads to a character whose name is Dorothy, 
Um, they break into Dorothy's house like twice. And then Kyle, or not Kyle, Kyle McLaughlin's the actor. Jeffrey hides in uh, Dorothy's closet because she comes home. Uh, is a little creep and watches her take all of her clothes off. Yay. Uh, as he's hiding in, in the closet, just being cr- weird and creepy. Um, I can't remember how she figures out he's in the closet. Does he like cough or something? I'm, I'm now struggling to remember as well. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, anyway, so she, she figures out he's in the closet. I think he like knocks something I think something she down. like reaches in there to get an article of clothing and finds him. No, no, she doesn't find him there. She gets the article of clothing. But then as he move, like, cause she has to move away from the peephole. Oh, maybe he just like makes a noise. Yeah. He like, he like jostles some hangers as he like moves back to his oh, peephole. Oh yeah. Okay. So she grabs a knife, makes him come out. So he's he's trying to do the Boy Scout. I'm gonna find the murderer because the cops can't do it. And she finds uh, a young man in in the closet, and is like, "Oh boy, here's a peeping Tom rapist." So she makes him take his clothes off. She. Uh, gives him a little stab in the face. Um, and then he convinces her that he's not there to be a rapist or a peeping Tom, but because he's trying to solve a murder. And then she starts having sex with him or just sucking him off. But this is interrupted. But this is interrupted when uh, Frank Booth, played by uh, Dennis Hopper, or... <laughs> As I will refer to him for the rest of, of the podcast, Daddy uh, <laughs> comes daddy home. Shithead, where's my bourbon? Yes. So Daddy comes home. So Jeffrey must go back into the closet so that so that Daddy doesn't find him. And so he walks into the into the room, and I I think Dorothy is like, "Oh, Frank." And he says, it's daddy, you shithead. Where's my bourbon? Don't fucking look at me. <clears throat> yeah, so, and then here's kind of where the movie, you figure out what the movie's about. It's all about, like, fucked up gender roles and dynamics. Shit that exists in society that you can't possibly expect when you're a little boy scout. Yeah, well, well, and yeah, and so, and so the whole bit with Frank is, is he's daddy, but then he sucks on some helium or, you know, he pulls out a gas mask, sucks on some stuff and becomes baby. Um, and, and so both, both daddy and baby are like abusive and, and needy towards the mother figure who is Dorothy. And, and, and so Jeffrey watches this happen um, so it is. I think the bit is that there's like some sort of pseudo psychosexual like thing going on where where Jeffrey is learning that men perform towards women as either violent, aggressive, or like infantile, needy babies. Or as <laughs> as as he can say in a. Uh, the year of our lord 2022 uh tops or bottoms oh yes i suppose so is that a bad take no i guess that's fine well i mean i don't know i mean he is a rapist so i guess that's not great that's not but i don't think that no i do think that that's like it is saying like these are the two roles and then unfortunately for for like women um I mean, well, women kind of have to be whatever the fuck the per- the person they're with wants yeah. them to be. Well, yeah, I, I mean, so, so, so I guess removing my point from Frank, you know, our daddy, it's it's the, this whole like, you know, you, uh, there's kind of two general camps of how, you know, men approach uh, like romance and women. And it's either as, you know, dad is like domineering and like, I will take you. Right. Like. You know, enforceful or or kind of this. Or they want a mommy. Woo, mommy. Yeah. I I I want uh, big titty goth gf woo woo. Right. Um, and I'm not like not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just that's that's the the dynamic. Um, uh, 
the director is trying to comment on here. Right. David Lynch is the director's name. My brain is jelly. Um, <laughs> it is fair. So um, yes. So it, it, the rest of the movie is is Jeffrey is in a relationship with Dorothy, while Dorothy's being abused in a relationship with Frank because Frank has Dorothy's husband and child captive. So the whole movie is just kind of this like web of of mystery that Jeffrey is trying to get to the bottom of. And just generally really bad love triangles. Yeah. And over the course of this movie, as Jeffrey interact or sees how, how Frank interacts with Dorothy, he starts to, to mimic the behavior he sees in Frank. So he starts out as this like, you know, goody goody two shoes, do no wrong boy scout who will do bad things, but it's only for adventure and because he's trying to do the greater good and he's trying to get that merit badge. And then over the course of the movie, he kind of devolves into a Frank-like figure where he he starts, he sees like mommy and daddy interacting in, in, a, in you know, sexual ways and then he starts to parrot those those behaviors mm-hmm. to, to women in his own life until... Uh, at about like a little over halfway through the movie, Frank finds out about Jeffrey, and then the movie kind of changes from being about how uh, how men and women interact, and then it becomes about the hierarchy of masculinity and Frank or Daddy having to teach Jeffrey his place in the in the you know in the. In, in the system, in, in the system, where he, yeah. he's like, he's like, all right, you've 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 blossomed, you've like figured out your masculinity and and where you want to be in this like masculine world. Now I'm gonna show you where you are gonna be because I am daddy, you shithead. Right. So he then he just kind of like beats the shit out of Jeffrey. It's insinuated that he he gets a little he gets raped, which <laughs> isn't great. There's kind of a lot of rape in this movie. Yes. Uh, and Just like in real life. Yeah. Yeah. So this movie's about rape culture, really, I think, generally. Well, I think this movie's about a lot of things. Yeah, but like, I mean, like, damn. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I, I think it's... I, 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 would, I would more so say that that the presence of, like, of rape culture in this, like, this just that that kind of engagement with with sex is more is more of a product of how we approach masculinity and femininity right and and so i i would say the movie's more just addressing it as it pertains to how david lynch interprets masculinity and femininity and growing in masculinity right well and so um one of the important things about about this movie it's a detail. It's a very small detail, but it's in there. Uh, at the very beginning, you'll see, like, they're watching detective shit on the TV. Mm-hmm. And so it's implied that that's kind of a regular everyday occurrence, which means that Jeffrey probably was regularly consuming that content, right? Mm-hmm. So it's drawing lines between the media that is, like, what the media is authentically saying versus like the quiet part right so Mm -hmm. like so like frank has an inability to say anything quietly that he thinks Mm -hmm. he is absolutely and this is this is why he's like so much you know Mm -hmm. he's like such a oh and and so the reason for all that is is because he's authentic he says exactly what he thinks and what he feels at any given moment. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sugarcoat it or change it. And that's, you know, it's, it's the, it's the thoughts of a raging psychopath, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. He's saying the thing that he thinks. Right. Just blatantly. Yeah. Well, in this movie, like everything is done very blatantly. Like characters don't really have hidden objectives. Yeah. They're They're all pretty out in the open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and, and that's just to, to try to make the metaphor more clear. Right. Because it is like, it is a psychosexual movie. So there's a lot you have to read into it to kind of get any understanding. So thankfully David Lynch didn't obscure it behind another level of like, 
what the character is saying versus what they want. Every, all the characters are pretty like, here's what I want. Right. Um, so anyway, so, so after Jeffrey gets, gets taught his place in the, in the hierarchy of masculinity, um, he then goes to the cops who go to bust Frank cause he has this like drug operation. Um, and then like, like Frank's world comes crashing down. All of his goons die in a gunfight with the cops. He goes to, uh, kill Dorothy and or Jeffrey um Jeffrey outsmarts him and shoots him in the face and then the robins return yeah and we come out of his ear yeah do you remember that i don't actually okay well that does happen um blue velvet blue velvet she wore blue velvet it's 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 very rapey. Um, I think that that's kind of the reputation it has. Also, David Lynch is a pretty mature filmmaker. He's not the kind of guy who who like makes movies for babies. So, no. like, you kind of got to go into it knowing that he's going to talk about rough shit. But mm-hmm. I think David Foster Wallace, who wrote Infinite Jest, who is probably annoying. Uh, he's also dead, so. Um, <laughs> Who cares? Uh, mm-hmm. Either way, he said of Blue Velvet that it was an exciting new kind of surrealism. It was a new, um, like neo noir, new American kind of surrealism that was commenting directly on the Reagan era, and was like the the clearest example of a movie that was trying to do that in a new way. Mm-hmm. So it was like revolutionary to cinema, and so the reason for that comes from the fact that like David Lynch's lineage kind of goes like this. Um, So he makes a racer head in college. It takes him 10 years to make it, which is kind of problematic um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) for being uh, successful. And so he makes it in, in college. Uh, Then he comes out in the midnight movie circuit, does really well, gets picked up by Mel Brooks, who then is like, uh, this guy's a genius. I want to give him money to make a movie. So he makes The Elephant Man, uh, which is like great. It wins him. I think he was nominated for Best Director uh, at the Academy Awards for that movie. Mm -hmm. So he did fairly good in that one. Uh, Anthony Hopkins is in that. I love Anthony Hopkins. It's pretty good. Uh, Anyway, and then immediately after that he's like they're like okay it's time to do something with david like it's time to give him a project and see what he can do you know it's kind of like giving him a star wars yeah so they give him dune and he doesn't know the fucking first thing about dune also quick quick interlude uh watch the the the, uh interview he has where he talks about george lucas trying to get him to do star wars oh yeah everybody's memeing the shit out of that it's really funny but um but yeah so he, he does dune um with Dino De Laurentiis and it's a fucking nightmare for him and he hates it, uh, which is also kind of a meme at this point. Like everybody knows that he fucking hated Dune. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Dino gave him, I think I want to say it was a, a two picture deal or at least a one where he was like, okay, you get to make another movie. I'll, I'll pay. If you make this, I'll, I'll pay for you to make something else. And so he was like, okay, I'm going to cash that in and I'm going to make blue velvet. Uh-huh. My angry fucking, rape culture movie and so like this movie is is debated widely (laughs) between whether or not it it expresses feminism uh feminist ideas or if it doesn't um if it is about rape culture if it's not Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a endorsement of that era if it's clearly criticism i feel like it's very clearly criticism yeah in the way that that so this kind of gets to the definition of like what is Lynchian, like what makes a movie a David Lynch movie, and and how do we even begin to figure out like how does he feel about things mm-hmm. based on what he's showing me here? Because oftentimes it's so disconnected and galaxy brain from what he's actually doing that you kind of have to like catch the you have to catch the ball and then throw it back. Right, and that's what makes his movies exciting to watch, um, but also difficult. Mm-hmm. So, like, Blue Velvet is an exciting new kind of surrealism, 
uh, in that for David, it was the birth of his career for real. I mean, mm-hmm. like Eraserhead was cool, neato, and fucking awesome. Elephant Man proved that he can, in fact, direct movies. Dune was really difficult for him and, and could have very easily killed his career. And the next thing that he did was absolutely essential. Well, I, I think I think you could say that Dune gave him connections because that's where he like, first worked with Kyle MacLachlan, right? It ended up being a blessing, I think, at the end of the day because he got Kyle MacLachlan out of it. He got... Um, there, were, there were a whole bunch of people that were in Dune that ended up working on Blue Velvet. Yeah, so I, I, I think I think I think you can make the argument that while Dune kind of sucked, it 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 networked him with a lot of the right people to make to make the shit he wanted to make. The thing you kind of realize in 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 a lot of lineages is like they don't ever really make mistakes. Mm-hmm. You know, like David Lynch really never made mistakes. I mean, he didn't do the right movie that the people wanted but he didn't really make a mistake so much you know because he he ended up meeting all these people and doing all this stuff and you know so it's kind of fucking weird like that but uh but we get to this place where he's he's making blue velvet which is like him like stomping on conservative america and inventing an entirely new kind of surrealism Mm -hmm. uh which completely recreated him uh, in in the public's image. He was no longer the Dune guy or the Eraserhead guy or the Elephant Man guy. He was like, "Whoa, what is he's David Lynch? What is this?" Right. And um, there is no other. There is no compare. Right. Mm-hmm. There's no one that's close. And so he goes on to make a lot of movies that are very uh, Lynchian. And so what what that. <sighs> as annoying as that term is because quote unquote critics can't figure out what this means. I think this is stupid. I can easily define what is Lynchian. Uh, what is Lynchian is something mundane portrayed, um, to it's like evil extreme. Mm -hmm. So like the thing about why blue velvet is so successful about talking about rape culture is it talks about how mundane but also psychotic Mm -hmm. sexuality is. Right. And so a lot of the things in the movie, you know, they, they're, they're rape, right? But they're not rape in the sense that irreversible, like that movie with the really gratuitous long rape scene. It's not like that. It's not, it's not trying to shock you so much with, with rape stuff as much as it's trying to, take human sexuality and make it so fucking absurd and and hideous mm-hmm. that it's difficult to look away from yeah and you can't help but think god the effect this must have on women yeah well he, he's using hyperbole to like hyperbole to, hyperbole I, hyperbole i don't i don't know how to speak english uh it's fine you're from kenya yeah well they speak english in kenya May. I, I know okay uh, so he uses, making a really he, stupid joke. he uses hyperbole to like to further the conversation akin to like how a normal conversation would work when someone uses hyperbole, you know? So it's, it, it's, yeah, it's, he, he's not trying to shock you. He's just trying to like exaggerate so that you can, you can get the point he's trying to make. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I like that in directors cause I, I can, you know, <laughs> miss points a lot. So right. I like, I like it when, when, when kind of the key point is like, just hey over here this is what i think yeah well yeah and see this is why i kind of genuinely contest this idea that like a lot of people say that david lynch's movies are like not about anything or anything like that i i think be- because he will he refuses to talk about them well because he's already explained but it in the movie that's how i fucking feel because he literally is standing there like a like a child with an ice cream cone waving his hands being yeah. like this is what i think yeah the whole movie and so i really don't well, connect with this criticism i think it's weak and lame when people don't like engage with the art um well it's like that it's like yeah. that one song the <laughs> um by uh is it the american pie i can't remember who it's by Don McLean. Don McLean, where like famously he won't explain the song to anybody, but 
and everyone's like, like, "Oh, what's this right song the about?" Song, though. Where it's like, but this, it's so fucking obvious what the song is about. It's you might like, as well fucking say it. It's painfully clear. So I think it's like, it's not that 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 he's trying to like obscure something. It's just that it's like, it's like, how did you not fucking get this? Yeah, why do I have to explain that the movie speaks for itself? Anything yeah. that I say about it is gonna make it is gonna dumb it down. <laughs> From the visual language that it is, yeah, and the the only the only possible way that David Lynch could 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 like show up and explain what the movie is about any more than he already does is if he did the Joe Dorosky thing where he he would say, "Hello, I am the director. This is what I think." <laughs> right, like literally going, "Hello," like. <laughs> Like he comes on screen, he's like, "Hi, uh, I'm David Lynch, and I think this." Yeah, but like, I mean, it's just so blatant. Like, like Frank is the only person who says "fuck" in the whole movie, and that's I know that that's a silly thing, but it's not in no. a lot of ways too because it's dem- it's demonstrable of what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that there's this Boy Scout bullshit in America. You grow up and you don't realize that uh, in the real world, people get shot in the head and their brains go everywhere and they get their arms and legs cut off and they get raped and it's yeah. bad and the fucking world is bad and there's bad people in it and they get away with whatever the fuck they want mm-hmm. like all the time and they do it to women all they want right. and they never ever face consequences, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so, so who do you blame? Do we blame Frank? Or do we blame the concept, right? And because Frank ultimately is a concept in the same way that Jeffrey is a concept. Well, well, I mean, I, all these characters are. Uh, well, what's the term for like in in Greek plays where they had like the archetypes? Is it just archetypes? Yeah, I think it's just archetypical. Where like yeah, yeah. So you know, in Greek plays, they would have like the mask. So one mask, and you put it on. You you would represent this character, and so and so right. and someone walked out on so, stage wearing this mask. You knew what the character was you, you you already had this like fundamental understanding of they're this like right. me, like medieval plays did this a lot too where when when the jester came out on stage you knew you knew his backstory he was knew, representing he, some grand idea of what a what that and that ideal piece of society you knew it he knew it so so they didn't need to explain i'm the jester here's what i do you already had this like fundamental like he's a jester this is what he does we can move on with his role in the story Right. So I feel like m- m- just about every major character in this movie is an archetype of something, and, and while they do change and ev- and especially Jeffrey, his archetype changes and evolves. It is very much I am the archetype of of of, of the youth who is just starting to engage with masculinity, and and how that and and, and how that well, know, and it's inter- unexpected. And, yeah. Right, because he he's engaging with masculinity at the beginning of the film by, you know, going and invading this woman's home and doing all this stuff that's really fucking stupid and invasive. But it's petty, dumb dude bullshit, like white dude bullshit. And you know, his girlfriend's along for the ride. But like, you know, there's so many moments in the movie where where Sandy is like, "Hey, hey, Jeffrey, hey, buddy, hey, man, my dude, I know you're doing this is like some sort of hot." stunt to flirt with me but maybe we cool it because yeah. you're breaking into a woman's fucking apartment and then he's like ha 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 you're being s- hysterical and stupid you're we're gonna do it anyway yeah and then they do it anyway you mm-hmm. know they do what he wants anyway they make the fucking mistake and then of course he plays it off like an idiot he pisses in her toilet like yeah. at one <laughs> point like what a fucking idiot so because he's a stupid boy scout and doesn't understand that when you do shit like that, you fucking die. And then, like, unfortunately, the I, I, I don't even know what the ending act <clears throat> is really, really, really meant to represent. But there's, like, this... There's, like, a coming out of the closet plus violence against daddy, yeah. you know, thing. And it's, it's kind of... It's kind of easy to read. Mm-hmm. Which makes it stupid hard to read. Because, like, an, uh, I feel like an easy read is just, like, this is about queerness... Uh, and then I, you know, and it's just too, too easy. Right. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's about some grander political thing, but, but this like, but there's, there's no denying 
that him coming out of the closet and shooting his father is so very oh yeah <laughs> yeah what, what that is <laughs> you know and and what is that ultimately right and it, it, the coming out of the closet and shooting your dad thing very literally is like i'm going to disobey my expectations right i'm, I'm, I'm not I'm, gonna be like you yeah I'm, I, I'm gonna break free of of the constraints you have put me in mm-hmm. well i'm and, aware and, of them and, and, and I in don't the want scene them. it's not only that he's hiding in the closet but he he like has a police radio on him and frank knows he has a police radio on him so he puts the radio in like the bedroom right so then frank walks in he's like are you hiding from me you idiot i have a radio too and he like says something in the radio mm-hmm. and he hears it in the bedroom and he's like oh you're hiding in the bedroom and he walks yeah. into the bedroom and then he finds the radio and and jeffrey's not there and so because well, that's you right there's a hubris to him which is his that's the thing about masculinity is like you defeat it because there's a hubris in it like men think they're unfucking defeatable for some goddamn yeah. reason uh which is funny because they're all also dealing with this like pathetic i'm baby thing so yeah. it's like you know from watching his parents fuck which is kind of the metaphor he's learned that his father is actually very weak in very specific ways Mm -hmm. uh and uh the comforts of his mother are weird (laughs) yeah (laughs) especially in this movie (laughs) yeah i i feel like this movie's got one hell of a complex man yeah but i mean like that's like almost a that's almost a cop out against it because it's like the movie's more talking about how these things manifest politically than anything. And also often how they manifest politically against women. And I find that these things strike very true. Like I would say that the things that are presented in blue velvet are very accurate as to what things are that happen in like rape culture, which is why I keep saying that, that thing. Cause it's like the idea that, that, you know culture itself has some hand in allowing people to be mistreated and uh people to be trafficked like women to be mistreated Mm -hmm. um based on like generations of you know internal masculinity uh manifesting in these like really disgusting bad behaviors that just never go questioned and with that i think it's time to go to a fucking ad break yeah my man so we would like to thank our sponsor, uh, Machine Age Productions, and their RPG hashtag I Hunt. Uh, it's economic horror about hunting monsters in the gig economy where eviction is scarier than Dracula. It's Buffy meets Uber. Um, if you've listened to uh, our uh, other episodes, we've we've talked about it. I've I'm reading it. I I I'm very close to finishing it because I <laughs> I read things way too slow um but i i like it i it's it's great i i bought it with my own money <laughs> you know so yeah check it out it's awesome thanks for sponsoring us also uh, we want to give a, a little shouty shout to our patrons over at patreon.com slash excrement thank you for supporting the page the podcast is what this is god dang it anyway listen I'm new here. I just started, and I don't know anything. So uh, thanks for supporting the podcast. We we are taking, like, advertisements um, at, at, at the $75. My ferret is going goddamn apeshit. Can you quit it, Angie? What do you do? You went out that bad to come play with me? Uh, we'll play with Angie in a second. Yeah, we'll, we'll, Angie, hey, can you give it a fucking rest? It's open. <laughs> We'll All get right. to you. <laughs> All righty. This has been the ad break. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon.com slash excrement. No, welcome back. Yeah. We, we just back. came back from the ad break. We, we we got out of our little podcast cubicle and got some coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I think that um, I, I, I really related with a lot of things in this movie and kind of I don't, it, in a way that made me uncomfortable. But it was just because it was like it struck really close to home, yeah. Um, and I think w- w- you made a comment, and I can't exactly remember what you said. So I'm gonna see if you can remember it about why men don't or why men are like find blue velvet uncomfortable. 
Okay, so so what I said was that the reason that men find Blue Velvet uncomfortable is it's a movie that makes, uh, it's like it's weirdly built in as an element to the movie somehow that it makes people want to white knight for the women who like it. Mm-hmm. Like I showed Neo the movie, I have showed countless people Blue Velvet. I showed it in a class in college, and I have had countless people say this movie is somehow it just rubs me the wrong way because I feel like this movie is bad to the women in it. Right. Says say mostly men, by the way. And and I I'm going to say instead of mostly men, I almost want to say entirely men mm-hmm. because I find that women usually are like yes, this fucking movie is saying the thing that's true. Right. And so they don't care. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't care about the fact that it's so fucking awful. Right. You know, and, and so this is like weirdly one of those disturbing movies where a lot of women are like, yes, correct. Right. You know, this is this one. Mm-hmm. You know, this well, this is for real. Yeah, I, I think it definitely like it it, it it speaks to a whole nother level to people who, who have been uh, mistreated, mistreated but, sexually. But men don't want it to be true. And no. so they'll white knight f- a towards you against the movie you like right yeah and so like my i I think the reason so i I said this movie made me uncomfortable yes and and may 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 told me that and the movie didn't make me uncomfortable because i wanted to like white knight for it Mm -hmm. but like the movie made me uncomfortable because i could i could see my own um like progression through through my masculinity through the movie and it's just struck really close to home yeah like so like i i like because you know kind of when i started my journey through masculinity like through puberty i was literally like hiking around in the in the safari of kenya yeah where i was i was i was doing the the do to do boy scout thing and i was i was like one time i was hiking around and i i just i came face to face with a buffalo with a cape like a like a cape buffalo and like i I looked this cape buffalo that fucking kills people all of the time in the eyes nothing between us it 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 was sitting there and like uh, with buffalo it's like a 50 50 chance whether they'll kill you or leave you alone like they're they're notoriously unpredictable and so i'm looking at this this buffalo (laughs) in Because I'm, you know, since I'm here, it decided not to kill me. Right. But like, and then it it barely faced me. I just went, no, oh, neat. Do, 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 do. And I just kept on walking down the trail with my friends. Not realizing how fucked that well, was. Well, I, I realized, but you know, you know, it, I, I, it's the Boy Scout thing. Like, oh, nothing wrong can happen. Like, nothing bad can happen to me. You know, it's the same kind of attitude Jeffrey Jackson. Like, I'm just going to break into this woman's house. Like, nothing bad can happen. Well, and see, that's the thing. The whole movie pivots. The movie carries an attitude. Uh, it embodies Jeffrey mm-hmm. in his perspective. It's almost like a dream he's living in. Mm-hmm. And he's living in this dream until Frank does the thing to him that maybe is rape. In an early draft, it was rape. Um, but I think when they shot it, they were like, we need to maybe <laughs> tone, tone, tone it, it down. Tone it back. So they toned it back. Um, but that's the idea, though. The idea is that this all changes when you experience this. Right. When you are the victim, it mm-hmm. changes it for you because you realize, oh, these, these aren't roles that I should be trying to be. Mm-hmm. These are things I should be actively killing in society. Right. But instead, these are the things that people are taught and learned to be. Mm-hmm. And so, like, until he was victimized by it, he didn't understand it. No, and, and, and he, he, like, mimicked it. So... So like, so know. he would have been one of the people. Like Jeffrey at the beginning of the movie would have been one of the people that would have watched Blue Velvet and white knighted against it. Yeah, well, because and then, he hadn't experienced so, it. But then if you experience it, then you're like, this is the fucking shit. Yeah, this one gets it. Well, well, so in the in the middle of the movie, like Jeffrey is taught how to be daddy. So right. so through, you know, through through watching watching daddy, he learns how to treat women. Right. And then he then takes that, you know, to and women. And it so on his, on his mom. Yeah. And so like I I uh in, in my boarding school in my I wanna say tenth grade, we 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 had a we had mandatory like Sunday school and then we'd go to mandatory church. And for tenth grade, 
like everyone in the school all all the men in the school in 10th grade um went through this like training where it's like how to be a man it's like it's like all there there's all these like kind of like idealist men like kind of machismo like all i got all the buff dudes on campus who are like like oh i i i man kind of dudes like right. the guy who's leading it was in the army uh you know at one point and so and then and so it was literally these these people teaching us how to be men and it in in it you know they they didn't like to to talk about sex because it was like a christian school and it is like well it's not it's not really engaged with that a whole lot but but there there was this this like it was like we're gonna teach you to some degree like violence and so like one of one morning like we went through like a boot camp thing which, like, as you know, is a cornerstone of of masculinity, being a violent person. Yeah, or or if like as a reward for some things, when we went on our camping trip, if you did good enough, you, you got to be the ones who slaughtered the goats. Right. And so, like, yeah, so like literally, like there we were, like just a like a gaggle of of tenth graders, and they handed a, a couple of us knives, and they were like, "Well, there's the goat's throat." Pitter patter, let's get at her. Like, right. like we got to eat tonight, and so you got to kill the goat. Yeah, and, well, and and like everyone who did it was just like, oh boy, yeah, 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 be. It's fine. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, and so then, so so so, kind of in the halfway point of the movie, um, Jeffrey's just kind of mindlessly doing, like mimicking the behavior he sees from Frank, and he hasn't thought about it. He's just been taught it. He's internalized it. And now he's repeating this behavior that, you know, this like toxic masculinity. Right. And and it kind of like culminates to when he's having sex with with Dorothy and he like punches her in the face. Right. Um, so then he's like literally just doing what he thinks he's supposed to do, like what she wants. And she even says that that's what she wants. But like, does she actually want it? You know, and that's a complex thing. Right. Um, and that is something I think that also comes with time is like realizing that consent is complicated. And a lot of times when people say they want things, they don't actually. Right. And, you know, they're dealing with trauma and they're dealing with things like that. So there's like all these other elements at play. So there's just all these things that he's just like straight up really dumb about. Yeah. And and just doesn't know. It's people just like falling into the, into their, their like the roles they're supposed to have in society. But, but the thing that he learns and the thing that that is like the big theme of the movie is mm-hmm. that there's nothing more fatal uh, than an angry man. <laughs> <laughs> an angry, uh, yeah, an with angry the, man. An angry man with a cause. Right, and that that that's the fucking whole thing of it, isn't it? Yeah. Um. Well, and it's like that's something you don't realize, you know. And so when you know David Lynch himself, right, is is growing up as a man in a world where men are fucking objectively awful. You know, and he wants to date women, right? But he has this problem that a lot of modern, you know, f- feministy guys have, which is like, I want to respect women and I want to be respectful to the women in my life. But I also um, do really like women and am attracted to them and would like to fuck them very badly. Yeah. So, like, how do you juxtapose those things in a society that's made sex weird and evil? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> So, and it's made every kind of sex that isn't weird and evil uh, queer yeah, and disgusting, you know, considerably mm-hmm. told, you know, told it's disgusting. Right. So, like, what, it's a, it is a bit of a pickle, Rick. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, so, so, <laughs> moving on to, like, the third act, or, the, like, the third major character transformation of Jeffrey is he... He he's found out by Frank, and then Frank like kidnaps him to take him on a tour of 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 what Frank does. So it's kind of like bring your kid to work day. Yeah. But but your dad's a criminal douchebag well, asshole. But that that's see here's that's another thing about capitalism, right? Your dad takes you to work, and what do you learn? Well, oh. Oh, my dad fucks people over for a living because yeah. it's capitalism. And, and all capitalism is everywhere is people fucking each other over for money. Right. So you're learning the rub, quote unquote. And the rub is basically like, well, what does daddy do? Well, daddy fucks people over for a living. Yeah. You know? 
And then and then so he and he also learns that that Frank's only meaningful male relationship is with is with the gay dude because because Frank sees everything in this like hierarchy of 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 I'm daddy you shithead and yeah, the only who person can I fuck? who can I fuck give me something to fuck I'm gonna fuck and then the only person who doesn't exist in this in this in this hierarchy to Frank is 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 the gay dude who sings right and and so and so the only other male character Frank is okay with like not being submissive to him and his masculinity is is you know the person he sees that's like outside of this outside of this thing but but frank this like hierarchy of even like ideal ideal like um jesus he idolizes him in ways yeah as well which is strange like he he sees him as being some kind of in inside scoop on on the way that things are and they almost treat him as like as 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 like the wise like like you know you you know movies they, they always like a lot of movies have the moment where it's like oh we need to go seek the wisdom from 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 the wise person so right. it's, it's almost that where he almost like goes to like confer with the, with the wise gay man yeah in a lot of ways and then well when so then when it gets real bad and real violent it's there's this theme of this song which is in heaven by uh um or I'm sorry in dreams by Roy Orbison which is like uh basically a song about <clears throat> male desire the dream of male desire right you know in my dreams i have you all the time you're mine mm-hmm. you know i possess you right and it's very literally like that mm-hmm. and so while the song is innocent and even attractive suave even mm-hmm. it still embodies these awful things that exist in masculinity and so what david lynch is saying is like hi i love roy orbison (laughs) because i use him in my shit all the time but notice that he's talking about the masculine dream in the same way that one's father would right and it's almost critical because it's it's a song that represents evil Mm -hmm. and as much as he might love roy orbison he understands that this dream that Roy Orbison is talking about is is an evil dream that's at the expense of women, right? And at the expense of of people, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, he's understanding his his father, and his father has a dream, and that dream is a very American dream, isn't it? Yeah, the dream of having it all. And Jeffrey feels at, at first like, okay, I have to do this too until it hurts him and he realizes the intricacies of it and realizes like oh damn i don't want to take part in this at all right and then he goes and has dinner with his (laughs) with his (laughs) with his mom Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) and it's just like the first i think that the 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 real tell in the movie is like the first thing he does after being victimized by frank is he goes and sits down and has breakfast with his mom Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like it's finally a moment where he's just with a woman in mm-hmm. a non-sexual context. Right. He's just with a woman, and he's mm-hmm. just sitting with her, and and in a weird fucked up way, he now understands her in mm-hmm. in some in and he doesn't, but he does in some dimension, and like there are some things that you can't put into words, right? Like that. Yeah. That thing. Well. And this is why David Lynch doesn't explain his movies. But anyway, go ahead. Well, I, well, he he's gained just enough insight to be able to empathize with her. Like, like he he hasn't gone through remotely what she's gone through. But, but he he can now empathize. But he's not least. he's not ignorant of it anymore. He now he now realizes the like the price of masculinity. Right. And it's a price that 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 the top dog that it's a price that daddy doesn't pay. It's right. the price that everybody that who, who interacts with him pays. Right. And and women take the brunt of it, but also But the, it's just everyone he interacts with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is is like a zero to his one. Yeah. It's yeah. it's he's the like the like the alpha CEO. Like And well and and like in a lot of ways every man has a part and this is maybe this is controversial, where at least they're told that they need to be, but it's a part of them that's like, yes, I will grow up to be a Frank, 
I will own my own business. <laughs> I will yeah. do what I want. I will say what I want and have all the free speech in the world. And I will fuck who I want to fuck. And I don't care about consent. And I don't need to hear this. So it's like he's living in this kind of conservative fantasy land Mm -hmm. where he can do whatever the fuck he wants to whoever he wants and say whatever he wants and all this stuff, which is true of America. And I think that that is the thing that the movie is really trying to get at, which is that, you know, ultimately saying what you want and doing what you want is kind of a capability of, of men in America. Yeah. And, and, I think the reason that this is a a new kind of surrealism that criticizes Reagan in specific is because, like, in a lot of ways, these are things that were championed and idealized and, you know, around Reagan. Like, the, these are these are concepts that, that were really championed by him, and they were concepts of things that we should have let go of a long time ago, but we kept on holding on to them. Right. And they're still with us. Mm-hmm. And nothing's changed at all. And so Blue Velvet is is like David's fucking angry movie because he <laughs> had just been fucked over by the system. <laughs> right. And, and I guess he understood something a little bit deeper. Right. But that's the weird thing about David is like he's always had this weird ability to make movies where he's talking, but it feels like he's listening. Mm-hmm. And... Yodorowsky's not like that. Yodorowsky no. tells you what to think. No, Yodorowsky's daddy. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like with Yodorowsky movies, you, you you're gonna sit in front of him, and as 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 a father figure, he's going to explain to you the bit. Right. Well, like, David Lynch isn't really like that. He's more no. just like, well, what do you think? Yeah. He's like, here's a stitch. What do you think? Mm-hmm. And and that that's the fucking thing. It's 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 humble, and I know that it looks like it's narcissistic, and a lot of people say that it's narcissistic, but I fucking vehemently disagree. Yeah, I think it's humble to be like, okay, here's my story. What do you think? Well, it's it's almost it's almost like Socratic like methods of of it's teaching dialectic, where he's, he's he's not imposing a narrative. No, it's dialectic. He wants there to be a dialectic about the things that he makes, and not a fucking here it is. Well, and, and it's almost like like <clears throat> like. Like he'll ask you a question where how do you engage with this and you'll answer it like watching the movie and then and then he'll ask you and he'll just ask you questions and he's not really it's psychoanalysis in yeah. a lot of ways and well and I mean you know the movie the large portions of the fucking movie take place with a boy in a closet okay <laughs> so it's a boy in a closet having a kind of visual conversation about his parents and it looks like. It looks like a noir movie. It looks like a horror movie sometimes. There's some fucking viscerally fucked up and scary things in this movie also. But mm-hmm. uh, also, you know, it's just a fucking movie where a guy is in a closet and he's paying attention to his parents. And he's like, damn, what do I think about this? And he never says, here's what I think. Yeah. He never says it. Because there isn't words. No, he but he he goes and he, he acts it like he like like he acts his beliefs and his convictions. Yeah, and so you know even even though he's hiding in the closet for a lot of the film, he's also kind of the he's kind of the driving force in the movie. Where where just about everything in the movie happens because he's 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 taking what he's learned and acting on it. Right. Well, and like I don't know, it's just like. I like David Lynch's approach to filmmaking more than Jodorowsky's, which is funny because I like Jodorowsky's movies. <laughs> uh, but but I like, um, I mean, I just like the way David Lynch approaches ideas because he, he doesn't approach them in a way that's like authoritarian. Right. And that's really nice. Like, I, I hate it when I feel like the filmmaker just is micromanaging me. Right. Jodorowsky has a lot of machismo. He does, and and David Lynch doesn't. Like nothing David does is all that flashy, really. I know a lot of people would probably disagree, but I feel like Blue Velvet is a very understated movie. Ultimately, mm-hmm. and while while there are caricatures of masculinity in the film, uh, even caricatures of femininity, and you know one can think what they want about those things. He's not sitting you down and going okay here's what i'm gonna tell you yeah <laughs> you know he's not telling you what to do 
which isn't to say that that that's leaving it open for some kind of weird conservative take but it's more just like it understands well don't don't <laughs> underestimate nice don't under, don't underestimate the conservatives ability is, to take criticism but understand that this but, is also why that white knight impulse exists everybody right. kind of kind of kind of kind of wants to be daddy mm-hmm. and everybody kind of kind of wants to tell you what to think right about it but david resists the temptation mm-hmm. and it pisses off a lot of people <laughs> and mm-hmm. but that's fucking powerful because he doesn't want to be daddy he just wants to be a schoolboy who who looks like he just does he just makes his dreams come true right because that's kind of what he is yeah and that's fine you know like well it it seems to me and like like so even before watching this movie and like watching his other movies um i it may just showed me a lot of just like when we were sitting on the couch and hanging out there's a lot of like interviews he's done and like just videos like things about him yeah. and things he said and he just kind of like he doesn't really have much of an ego like like a, a lot of like he he he's like a uh he's a performance artist in a way yeah you, you know do you know who harmony Karina is no okay so harmony Karina is a filmmaker from the 90s who got fame at 18 Mm-hmm. So he got fame at 18. He got addicted to hit like heroin, I think, or meth at 21 or something like that. So ridiculous. And uh, I can't remember which fucking drug he was on. It was probably heroin. And <laughs> anyway, the point is like he knew that he was a filmmaker in the public eye. Mm-hmm. And he knew that he could go out there and he could be one of those fucking assholes who's like, yeah, I made this movie, man. It's real serious. But instead, he went out on stage drunk frequently whenever they had him do Letterman appearances and shit. Mm -hmm. And he'd just be like, yeah, I'm a fucking idiot. My movie's made of trash. Right. And he's just like, I don't know. I made it because I was up on... I I picked the kid who was in the movie because he was sniffing glue on TV. Right. And it's just like... He's playing a character Mm -hmm. of himself. Mm -hmm. And... And, like, you know, whether or not he is that or isn't that is his own business. But in the public eye, the Harmony Korean we see isn't necessarily the Harmony Korean we get. And the same is true of David Lynch. Like, Right. I met David Lynch's daughter once, and she said that he's a very passionate man. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt this. He doesn't pretend to not be passionate. I think he's fairly authentic. But I do think that there's some level of, I know that if I make this about me, then it's going to be about me. Right. Well, it's just, he really wants people to, to, to take what he says and figure it out themselves. And he really doesn't want to tell you. Well, I respect well, it's, that. Yeah. It's like, I'm smart enough. It, it's, it's, it's like my favorite like interaction of his, he's had where someone was like, I think the I think the the like the interviewer was like you claim God God is a woman can you explain that he's like no okay that's not exactly no? what he said what he, oh. what he said is I you say that Eraserhead is your most spiritual film oh that's it I don't know where I got God is a woman because somebody because people have memed that yeah. to shit and put fake things in his mouth you know <laughs> I think I put one out there that was like I think that you know trans women are are women and. And he's like explaining and he's like no and you know it was like funny right. it was like four years ago or something like everybody memed the shit out of that but i'm sorry david lynch for, 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 <laughs> he, for he forgives for you okay misinterpreting you he forgives you he loves being a meme i think <laughs> <laughs> um but but i know for sure that um like he's a very passionate person and he's got a lot of shit that he cares about that he, whoop drop that there's there's a <laughs> lot of sh- there's a lot of shit he's passionate about that he can't get done and it's the great sadness to him that he struggles so much to get his projects made because he's actually a workhorse he cares and he has ideas and he's got no shortage of that and like he's kind of one of those filmmakers that when we're talking about like lefty kind of stuff mm-hmm. he's always kind of been on top of it i mean there's that roman polanski thing that was a little bad and then there's like some shit with the fucking uh, <laughs> Tibetan Buddhist shit. But as far as his movies go, 
think he's cool. <laughs> I think he's fine. I think we can leave him alone. He has an NFT. <laughs> I mean, not well, not great with not Interpol great. for some reason. But once you get, I don't know, <laughs> once you get to a certain age, I, I can forgive you for It's just really not, not about him, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, it's so fucked up how I can, out of one side of my mouth, say, I love David Lynch, I love his movies, but also say, it's not really about him, though. But it isn't. But 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 that's because he that's because he intentionally made it not about him. He's a world creator, and he gives you problems. He does like he he gives you a problem, mm-hmm. and he's just like, here's your problem. And he's not really a guy that solves problems. He's just a guy that that gives you problems, right? And you know his movies are ultimately enigmatic because they're problems, and they're problems for us, mm-hmm. like psychologically and that's that's something we we kind of have to overcome about his work right and i feel like it's almost the most pretentious thing in the world to say that you have to be like kind of strong willed to (laughs) attempt because they're not that hard to understand but I do think we that believe in the audience too. We, I also we, I believe, believe in the y'all. audience, but but I do think that, and I and I've also heard a lot of respected intellectuals not like David Lynch, and I've heard exactly why. I I unfortunately disagree with with them. Um, although I do still love them, uh, I I must unfortunately disagree. He's my boy, and I can't stop loving him. Mm-hmm. Is Blue Velvet going in our shit pile, or is it going in the shit pile? You know what I mean? It's we like it it's 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 we we spent an hour gushing about how 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 much we you know i'm gonna level with you when this podcast started i did not know how you were gonna come out on the end of this i didn't know if you were gonna swing towards the movie or against it because you've kind of been going back and forth well, all week with, as we've been talking blue about velvet it. yeah well i mean i don't i don't think you ever disliked it but there was no. a moment where you said okay I think it was well performed. I think it was well made, but I hated watching it. <laughs> you know, yeah, I didn't like watching it, and well, that's valid. That's because I have fair. I have a little like <laughs> rat ADHD brain, and oh, so yeah, it was it, it was it was really hard for me to watch because it's because because he he's just like he makes movies for people with attention spans, and I They're don't very patient. I don't have an attention span. I need right. like. Yadarowski like, is not like that. He, no. he throws it at you like as fast as humanly possible. Yeah, I need. Yeah, I need like. You see, and, and this is where a I re- metaphor a minute. This is where I reveal. Like I like. I like move. Like like when left to my own devices. If you just sit me in a room and like observe what I and you give me like Netflix and you just like watch what I you know like you like watch what I watch. Given my own devices, I'm just gonna watch John Wick. Well, I'm just gonna watch goo, goo, pew, 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 pew wee, <laughs> yay, right. kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. So it's 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 like I, I liked it, and, and you know you can't like watching David Lynch films, you can't deny his like his art, you know. It's like sure. even if you don't like it, you can't you can't deny what he did, and so I'm not like I liked it, you know. So yeah. in, in the end, in the end, it like 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 the liked benefits it. of it outweighed what I found hard or, or what I disliked about it. Right. And like the things I disliked about it are things that are needed f- for the movie. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's like if, if, if you don't take as much time as he did, like just very purposefully crafting the metaphors, then they, then, then they don't hit with the full force that they need to. So, so like, it's just, you know, it was hard for me to watch. I, I kept on almost falling asleep, not because I thought it was bad or because I wasn't I mean, enjoying it, but just it's because intentionally slow and dreamlike. Yeah, it intentionally every frame of the movie challenges you, like to continue watching it mm-hmm. because it doesn't behave like a movie, and I think that that's kind of the big, the th- that's sort of the when we talk about the neo surrealist, like what is the surrealism? It's that. It's a delicate, patient kind of surrealism. It's, right. It's not, here's a metaphor, but it's like a, we're going into metaphor world. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also it's kind of, it's kind of exhausting to watch because of that. Right. Where it's like, and it's not Sometimes even. Sometimes you want out of metaphor world. Well, so like Jodorowsky's metaphor world, but it's, 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 he'll hit you with metaphor. He'll give you time to like, to like, to, to, to put it in your absorb brain. It. And absorb it. And then he moves on. 
Yeah. Because he wants he wants to get as much of his paternal masculine wisdom in your brain as he can. Like right. David Lynch is 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 not trying to do that and he's and he's like, all right, here's here's the metaphor I want to communicate. So yeah. I'm gonna spend all of my goddamn time on this. Okay. So I'm gonna end this episode off by telling you a little anecdote. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Um. So, Twin Peaks is a very popular show. It was, I need I need it, to watch it. We at do some point. eventually. Maybe we should make a Twin Peaks pop podcast. We do episode <laughs> by episode one of these days. That'd be fun. Um. Anyway, just if we ever need another podcast. <laughs> uh. What do you think at home? Anyway, so uh, Twin Peaks is popular in the eighties, right? Then it kind of tanks, and then it kind of ends, trickles away. Twenty five years pass. And uh, then new Twin Peaks. Big, so no one thought this was going to happen. Everybody was like, there's no fucking way. Mm -hmm. But then it did. Mm -hmm. It did happen. And then everybody was like, well, what the fuck is new Twin Peaks going to be like? And then you watch it, and it's way different than you thought it was going to be. But also kind of the same. And then you get further into the season and he's releasing them once a week like slow yeah once a week hour and a half episodes oh my god they're so long oh my god he just wants a fucking movie oh my god and so you fucking get to episode i want to say it was eight was the one where it is an explosion of psychedelia Mm -hmm. the most psychedelic episode of tv i've ever seen Mm-hmm. insane and and so you're like holy crap holy shit like okay <laughs> all right okay mm-hmm. so the nine inch nails come out on stage and they're like well there's a guy on stage and he's like ladies and gentlemen the nine inch nails and then the nine inch nails come out you know Trent Reznor and they play a song and you're like what the fuck and then like it keeps on going keep on trucking and we get to a place where the most psychedelic shit has ever that has ever happened on TV has happened on cinematic TV on Showtime of all networks (laughs) in the hands of David Lynch eight episodes into the reboot of Twin Peaks right season three and you're like, what the fuck is going to happen next? And he opens the next episode. <laughs> I shit you not. I think this is literally, I think it is in the lineage of events exactly like this. He opens the next fucking episode where you're like, I want answers. Mm-hmm. God damn it. Mm-hmm. After all this, you're like, I want answers. And it opens with a scene. A shot that is literally five whole minutes (laughs) of a guy sweeping the floor. (laughs) He knows. Yeah. He knows what you want. He knows. Mm Mm-hmm. That's all I got. That's all you got. <laughs> That's all I got. All right, y'all. Have a a blessed day in, from by from our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, I don't know where that came from. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I where that came from is at some point we 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 record a little mini episode. Oh yeah, we're doing mini sodes now. Yeah, every once in a while. Well, people like the podcast, so we're going to do more of them. So we were like, okay, mini sodes and then I just said that thing about the Twin Peaks podcast, which I think sounds like a great idea. I think I, people are going to be talking about that. I one think once 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 this gets to the point where I can like live work, off of it. Live off, or I'm not going to say live off. I'm going to say like work, work part time. Yeah. So I can work so I can like dedicate more of my life other than like the limited free time i have right i work full time so once i can dedicate like a little more time to more it. time to it fair i'm gonna if if, if someone had go i'm gonna do i'm gonna do anything and everything i'm gonna you gonna got twin it. peaks hell yeah <laughs> so i guess with that message Patreon.com slash excrement <laughs> is how we pay our Neo to keep working on this podcast and all other continued podcasts uh, here at the fucking Your Take is Excrement podcast studio that yeah. we have. 
Um, Otherwise known as our kitchen table. <laughs> where we buy batteries <laughs> yeah. uh, and use them. All right, y'all. It's been fun. Um, go forth and be safe. Next episode's a double episode, so get the fuck ready for that one. And it's on a classic. And then Hell yeah. we're probably going to go from here to watch a fucking disturbing nightmare movie at some point for a future episode that you're going to hate. So that's going to be great. And everyone's going to be all mad. It's I love this. Yeah. 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 See y'all later. Bye.